Thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, my name is Allison Filler. I'm currently an MBA candidate here at Said, and this year I have the pleasure of serving as a co-chair of the Oxford Business Network for Climate. And I'm joined today by Rose Kopsinghe, who is a Ugandan climate activist. And we're gonna have a conversation about climate on the continent today. So thanks for joining us, Rose. Thanks, Allison. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, especially seeing this amazing audience around. Yeah. yeah, you are an Oxford alumna, is that right? Yeah, yeah, I did an environment change and management course last year at the Environment Change Institute. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I've been in this building quite a number of times, so I've been so. Well, welcome back. Thank you. Tell us a bit about your background. How did you get into climate activism in Uganda? Oh, wow, um, that's quite a long story. So before I became a climate activist, I was a young little girl uh, from Port Porto. You've been to Uganda, you know where mm -hmm. Port Porto is in Western Uganda. Beautiful. And uh, I come from a family uh, that relies on agriculture, really. And my parents work in a tea factory. So, and whatever happened in terms of, you know, droughts and I really, I was on the front line for that, seeing droughts increasing and my parents would easily get laid off from work, which affected our food security, affected this kind of schools I went to and my siblings. They still work in, actually, they still work in a tea factory up to now. So um, I've been on the, front, uh, on the front line for floods in Kasese in Uganda, uh, the landslides in Ubundibudio and uh, in the eastern parts of the country. And yeah, and then I just didn't know what was happening. Like, I was like, oh, the things happen. And, uh, but when I finished my A-level, as I was going to do my undergrad, that's when I wondered like, what course am I supposed to do? I was also in love with, you know, uh, wildlife and nature conservation, but not at a career level or education level. So then I decided to do, uh, because of my experience, I decided to do my undergrad in my undergraduate degree in environmental management at Macquarie University. And surprisingly, I had never heard anything about climate change until I started doing that undergraduate degree and I was hearing, oh, climate change. And it sounded like something really far, a Western thing, you know, a fancy scientific finding. And it wasn't like that serious in my course. But then the more I got open to, you know, there was an elective on climate change adaptation. That's when I was like, wow, climate change is serious. And it's what I've been witnessing in the country and in my own community. So I started getting on social media, trying to learn a bit about climate change, but yeah, just from my own motivation. And I uh, was also involved in like a climate change club in the university. Then I got a scholarship to uh, the Environment Change and Management Institute to do a course in environmental change and management. And everything made sense then. It was like, wow. So it's not that droughts and floods and you know cyclones are because of climate, exactly because of climate change, but climate change is increasing the, the uh, frequency and the severity of these extreme weather events. And coming from, uh, I'm sure most of us here may have an idea of uh, the African local communities is that if, like Uganda, almost 70% of the total population in Uganda, where I come from, is directly and directly uh, relying on agriculture. It could be directly as farmers or as, you know, entrepreneurs or, you know, hawkers like for selling around fruits and everywhere in the city. And for me, realizing that this existential threat, the climate threat, the, the climate reality is caused by, you know, countries that have already secured the future for their people through exploiting fossil fuels and, uh, and now they're at the point they have high adaptive capacity. My country and my pe most people in my continent cannot easily adapt, cannot easily adapt to the floods, cannot easily adapt to the drought. So if I may ask uh, just to, to hear what the audience thinks. Please. Yeah. Uh, like, what do you think climate change is to you? Climate change. What do you think climate change is to you? Sarah? Yes. Temperature rising. Temperature rising. Yes. Level water rising. Uh, sea level uh, water rising. Yes. Yes. Exactly. So all these are like very right and correct, 
But back to my community, climate change means water crisis. Climate change means famine. Climate change means cows and goats dying from uh, being thirsty and no pasture. Climate change means women walking very long distances to go and fetch water. Uh, climate change means diseases, the malaria increasing because of the temperatures increasing. So we can see that when you look at climate change, it depends on, I don't wanna say level, but they have people that are on the front line that feel these harsh you know, impacts. Some of them, most of them in fact, don't have a voice. And the few that have a voice are not being listened to. And that is what motivated me to join climate activism. I was like, okay, I know in Uganda, for example, many young people don't care about climate change. They care about getting a job. They care about having food to eat this, that same day. They care about being able to buy paracetamol when they, they're feeling a headache. Mm -hmm. And bring your climate change, you know, fancy talk is just like, this person doesn't understand what is happening on the ground. But the challenge is that they are the same people that are highly vulnerable to climate change. So having been in that process, having been on the ground and facing the direct impacts, it gives me, and having the opportunity and the privilege to study about climate change. The curriculum in Uganda doesn't talk about climate change. No, it doesn't. So that, that change of frame for you, that mindset change came in university. Yeah. How, how can you elevate the conversation for folks who don't have the opportunity to attend? Exactly. So that is what uh, I've been doing with other young people. The Vanessa, as they are destined, quite a number of young people in, in Nigeria. There's one called Mr. Climate, there's Joy. Like, uh, we have a kind of a coalition. We are calling it African Youth for Climate. And uh, we were at the COP26 where the pre-COP uh, pre Youth Summits. Uh, COP is like conference of, of parties. Uh, it's, it's kind of an annual uh, event where different states and governments meet up to make decisions regarding climate action. So as young Africans that have the privilege to know about climate change, but also know that we can act in, in different ways. One is holding the polluters responsible and demanding them to pay for the mess that brought us into. And the other way is holding our own leaders, our African leaders also accountable to act because we cannot ask the, Euro the European and uh, US to act and then they send in the money and the money gets lost in corruption and it doesn't actually re I mean, reach to the local person, the local farmer, the local woman who needs uh, the real help. So um, the other way that I'm calling like fellow young people, even here in the room here is that as you innovate, I've been in the previous, uh, in the previous session uh, talking about systems thinking and everything. As we innovate and, and build, up, build these businesses, I think the right thing to do is to integrate an aspect of how does this investment improve people's adaptive capacity? How, how is, first of all, how is the business adaptable to climate change? How does it mitigate climate change? How does it help people to adapt to climate change? Because the challenge is that climate inaction is putting pressure on Africa. If no action is done, it's our countries that are going to suffer the most. First of all, we cannot adapt. Uh, we don't have high adaptive capacity because we don't have the resources, the infrastructure, and even the few resources that we have will get lost in you know, corruption and you know, embezzlement and, and stuff. So that is why it's, 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 quite, it's quite tricky, but it also brings an opportunity for the young, enthusiastic people that have the privilege to know about climate change to spread the information and you know, bridge this information gap. Because the local farmer in Uganda doesn't have the opportunity to go and negotiate in COP26. Mm -hmm. And building on that, about your experience at COP in Glasgow, tell us about the youth engagement at that event. And 
your efforts to hold leaders accountable? Yeah, that, that was that was a crazy time. <laughs> so uh, we're there, there were a lot of, of strikes and, you know, and, you know, we were first, we first hoped that, and that we're told that COP26 was going to be the most inclusive, you know, COP ever by the UK government, which was the hosts. And we were like, okay, we shall see, because Boris would come in like, the youth, you know, you're going to be, you're going to be the leaders, you know, reaching there, reaching uh, in Glasgow, it was in Glasgow, and they're like, well, um, yeah, you can stay here in the pavilion mm -hmm. uh, because this is really high level. And uh, they did a little bit of cherry picking, take a few one, two up there. And they're like, yeah, we gave you the platform. You know, we hear you. But, and for us, uh, that's why we ended up doing two massive strikes. Uh, we had, so many global activists, the Greta Thunbergs, the Vanessas and everyone around. We did, we had two massive strikes amid this like very, very uh, heavy rainfall and everything. But for me, uh, even though I see there were a lot of weaknesses in COP26 in terms of engagement of women and youth, because we realized the number of fossil fuel, you know, lobbies was, the number was so big compared to you know, youth compared to uh, farmers on the ground. The lobbyists were really strong in, in that, in, that, in, that uh, in, in COP26. But now we have COP27 coming, an African COP, how we are calling it, uh, going to Egypt. I saw someone from Egypt, yeah. <laughs> so COP27 is coming to Egypt and we are hoping to see a massive change. We are hoping to see, because this is what I always say, you know, we're like African youth, you know, hearing us. And now it has come to us. We need to show an example to the West, to, to Europe and US, like, okay, this is what actually can happen. This is how inclusion, this is how real decision-making that, that involves the people, not only as a token, but real involvement, real inclusion uh, takes place. But again, with COP26, uh, yeah, there was a lot of young people. And uh, I think what I learned from that is how can young people use the little opportunities that we receive to actually make them bigger and stop maybe over crying, I would say. Mm. Like once you get an opportunity to reach at any gate in COP26 or COP27, what is it that you can do? There were a lot of people walking around, coming back, walking around, but there were many opportunities to get the microphones and speak. There were many opportunities to go to the pavilions and ask you, like, we're organizing a youth event. Minister so and so, are you coming in? If you're not, we move to the next one. Mm -hmm. So, because there were quite a number of people that were supportive in terms of like having the youth voices in there. It's only, um, yeah, the top, the top, leadership that would always say, yeah, you have every right to get angry and everything. And I think the young people, we're really tired of that. Mm. And yeah, we want to lead, we want to frame and shape our own future. What do you think it will take to switch, to make that important switch from tokenized participation to meaningful uh, and accountable participation? Well, it's going to take a lot of uh, energy because as a climate activist, sometimes I just get overwhelmed and sometimes I get demotivated and everything. You know, today you're calling out for uh, the investment in, in fossil fuel and the UK a few weeks ago approved, you know, a new oil field in the North, in the North Sea. Mm -hmm. And you're just like, what am I even doing? But then it's gonna need to, uh, we're, gonna be, we're, going, we're gonna need to be consistent and uh, have more fire into us and uh, continue holding leaders accountable and calling them out and putting these, you know, dirty investments up there for people to know what, what, what is happening. Because we thought the UK is the climate leader, but the actions that are happening don't show that. Uh, the US, you know, we saw Biden coming on the, the leaders' summits uh, during COP and, you know, he got so many hand claps and everything and the moment Biden left the stage, the, in the negotiation rooms, the US was very troublesome. It's just different from what the big leaders say. 
there's a difference what, between what the big leaders say to get hand clubs and the reality of the actions and, uh, and the negotiations. So I think as young people are gonna need allies. Uh, I saw that during the climate strikes in, in Glasgow. It was so encouraging to, to see the elderly, the disabled, the young children, the young couples also joining in. And for me, as like, if the leaders could, regardless of where you come from, your background, your age, or what, people are coming in demanding for climate justice, demanding for action. And if the leaders also kind of did something like that, would go to a better, uh, safe climate. But then coming back to how to change uh, that frame, uh, as I say, the young people are going to do a lot of, we're gonna need to do a lot of things. One is continuing to call leaders out. Two is leading. Because I don't think today or tomorrow we are going to be presidents or, or anything, but we can be leaders from wherever we are, starting from whatever we can in, in our own capacities. It can be taking leadership to innovate, uh, something as small as you know agroforestry, uh, an agroforestry project. And there are opportunities right now, uh, many investors and many funders looking for sustainable investments. It could be in tech, it could be in anything. So young people, we're gonna need to in innovate. We're gonna need to advocate. We're gonna need to spread the climate awareness in our communities that don't have the chance to, to come and study or go and innovate, I mean, go in uh, negotiate. And uh, yeah, I think, I think those are quite key. And yeah, there's a lot that can be done. So moving from this global stage um, back to Uganda, how prepared are communities where you're from to tackle climate adaptation? Well, the answer is they're not prepared. Uh, they're not prepared. And sometimes, uh, I don't know if any of you think about it, but sometimes I'm like, oh, really, thank God that we don't have these so many cyclones in Africa, so many hurricanes, because I would imagine if we had many of them, we would never recover. You know, you see the developed countries, the cyclone hits it, and the next day it's back. And it's like, how? So the adaptive capacity in most African countries is really low, mainly because of the long, the historical injustices and inequalities that most of them have been, you know, led by these Western countries. So going back to colonialism, in fact, I was talking to someone at some point and they're like, we should stop calling them developing countries, but, or highly developing countries, but call them highly exploited countries. Okay. So uh, the exploitation that had, has happened historically uh, has left our communities vulnerable in terms of like their incomes, our, their, their wealth, their knowledge and understanding of you know, these events. And, Cause many people, in fact, I did my, in my undergraduate, I did my dissertation on food security and climate adaptation. Then I found, I did an interview of about 200 people and I found 90% of the people had never heard anything about climate change. But 100% knew that there was something different, that the droughts had increased, that it was getting hotter, that the seasons were unpredictable. We don't have the infrastructure to predict. It's gonna, like today I was checked on the weather, like, oh, it's gonna rain at this time. That doesn't happen back home because there's not enough infrastructure to do that. So people had their knowledge, their traditional knowledge of knowing the season starts at the beginning of March, that's when we plant. The rain will start on the 15th, and it always happened. But now, no one knows because of climate change. Mm -hmm. So, uh, it's, just, it's just tricky because for us who now know about climate change, now it is the it's our challenge to take it up and help our communities. For people who are in this building, in this room today, you now have the knowledge it's now the challenge is on you to help your communities in any way that you can for them to adapt to climate change. So, um, it, like if you look at Africa as a whole, one point, about 1.3 billion people, our historical responsibility to, to climate change is about 4%. The whole continent, 
the whole continent. And, but that doesn't mean that it's not going to grow because we need to grow, we need to develop, right? And if you look at Uganda as a country, it recently, in, I think at the start of February this year, uh, an investment decision was made to invest in oil and gas, uh, where we are calling the East African crude oil pipeline. And you see there are these climate ar agreements and climate ambitions. But again, Africa, we need, we need electricity. We do need electricity. We need energy, we need power, we need light, we need energy for cooking and everything. But how can we develop in a way that is in line with the climate uh, targets? But the challenge is, the challenge is uh, most African countries, they aspire to be like Europe. They aspire to be like, you know, US. And they're taking the same development pathways of relying on fossil fuels because they have no leader to see like, well, this country developed relying on renewable energy and they managed to maybe develop faster. That is not there. But how, what is our role as young people? Do we really think relying on fossil fuels and going against the climate targets? Because we have very few years to solve this climate issue. Do we think that is the right development that we need? And can we influence our leaders to take a, sustain, a more sustainable development pathway? So that is the questions that we need to think about. And that is what each one of you should be thinking about in terms of your contribution to a safer climate. And with regard to that balance between electrification and economic development, as you said, and environmental limits, do you hear much from youth activists about efforts to include more renewable energy sources in that transition? Uh, the truth is, uh, no. I mean, the challenge with you know, climate activism uh, is that people choose what they think uh, they're good at. Someone may be good at calling out leaders and telling them very hard words, and someone may choose to, yeah, to just work at the local level. So when it comes to like calling on uh, investment in renewable energy, that has not been very uh, strong, mm -hmm. but what has been strong is do not invest in fossil fuels. And that is why if you check my Twitter account, you'd find like I've been calling people. The, when you're saying do not, invest in, do not invest in fossil fuels, add where should they invest? So, and I think uh, that shows that once, yeah, once young people do that, I think it shows that it's not just a matter of like going with a trend, no fossil fuels, going with a trend of like no fossil fuels, but this is the safer investment. This is a more realistic and more sustainable and more economically relevant and socially relevant investments. Yeah. And looking at the continent more broadly, are there regions or specific communities that are emerging as particularly innovative when it comes to climate adaptation approaches? Um, yeah, I mean, at this moment, I think the young people have come up a little bit more stronger in terms of coming with our startups, sustainability startups. There have been a lot of challenges uh, in startups and scalability and everything, but I've been seeing online uh, number of startups increasing, especially on uh, adaptation in the African context. And my only challenge with our startups is most of them are, do not really look at the scale, a startup starts today, let's say an app, an app on uh, informing farmers on when to plant or not. And then when it starts and it didn't look beyond, it didn't look at the system uh, level of which kind of farmers are we looking at? How many farmers actually have access to smartphones? Mm -hmm. How about those ones without smartphones? So you find when an investor comes, they're like, no, you're not investing in this. It's a good idea, but no, no, thank you. And as young people, they get frustrated. We get frustrated. And again, uh, you find the startups do not actually yield so much for the other young people, let's say, in Arua or Lira, where you've been uh, also. The young people there, most of them do not have smartphones, right? 
or do not have money to buy MBs, which is mobile data. Mm -hmm. So I think for, we need to go and think beyond just easy things. And of course, there are easy things that work out. I have a friend, uh, he has started an initiative called Pipa Nature Initiative. You could look on it on online, Pipa Nature Initiative. It's just simple, just educating kids in school about climate change and planting trees. Okay, that is simple and it has impacts at local and of course international level. But there are some initiatives that really don't look at how many people are going to get engaged, what is the benefits and how does it rank at the global level in terms of competi how competitive is the initiative. Yeah. So in 10 or 20 years, what would success look like for you in terms of climate activism on the continent? Yeah, I think uh, success to me would first of all look like uh, having the whole population aware of the climate emergency <coughs> because we have been, we're struggling even with our leaders, our presidents. Uh, like the president of Uganda recent, recently when he has started speaking a bit about climate change and renewable energy. And, uh, but whenever he's talking about renewable energy, he's saying, oh, we shall not abide by the Western climate goals. Well, he could, he's right, because uh, we're seeing the, the Western countries have climate targets, but like less than net zero, the net zero targets. But when you look at the strategies out there, they don't meet the net zero targets. And when you see the decisions that are ma they're making, they don't match with the net zero targets. But uh, in Africa, um, I don't know if there's anyone from Gambia, the Gambia, uh, the Gambia was, has been one of like the key African climate leaders in terms of like the Paris Agreement targets and what they're doing on the ground in terms of investment in renewable energy. Like Africa has immense, immense potential for renewable energy, especially solar. But like, like Uganda, I don't even imagine every day we see sunlight. Every day we see sunlight. And I'm just like, but we're not investing in solar energy. So is that a key area, is that a key opportunity for investment? Yeah, it is a very key opportunity. It's just that uh, there's just a few structural things that, that need to, because sometimes this, the investment environment, environment uh, or investment climate matters, because in Uganda, no private investor can decide to, let's say, lay down a, a mini grid and connect it to the main grid or somehow distribute electricity to the village. That's not possible because of the policies in the country. So, and that is why I would really say uh, from the previous discussion on uh, systems thinking and everything, I think the leaders still have strong influence on what happens in the country. And, uh, but again, it's the young people, we have the power to change what is happening in the country to go in a way that we want our future to, to be like. So, like, if all people know about climate change, then that is one step. But there's a step on what do they do then if they know about climate change? So like a decade ago, in one of the COPs, there's uh, an agreement uh, to, for, for the developed countries, the polluters, the emitters, to, to commit 100 billion US dollars to help developing countries to adapt and mitigate climate change. A decade later, that has not yet happened. And, and the, for, the, for the developing countries, they go back and they're like, is, this, is climate change something like a joke? People are taking as a joke. But the thing is that they know it's not a joke because we know it is happening and we are at the front line. We see the floods, the landslides. Like uh, when I was growing up, uh, and uh, you know, I don't know if you know Kasese, but we used to have floods at least once in three years, once in five years. But right now, every year, we are assured of floods at least two times. And whenever they come, tens of people die, hundreds are displaced. And like the, fre the frequency, the magnitude and severity, they're just increasing. And we just know like, wow, that is the climate. It's the climate that is changing. So, um, so once we demand the polluters to pay for the mess through the climate finance that they promise, and I think our demand is that there shouldn't be loans because 
our African countries are already overwhelmed with uh, debt burden. Uh, for example, in Uganda, I think people have, have been making memes saying that uh, one day they, the, the creditors will just decide to take all of us because the debt burden is just, <laughs> is just really high. Mm -hmm. and, but you see what these developed countries are doing. The, develop, the developed countries is that they're like, yeah, we'll give you 100 billion, but they're loans. Most of them are loans. But that's not fair and that's not justice because they led us to the problem. And now they're increasing the debt burden on African countries. Uh, recent, it's last week, last week when the IPCC reports, uh, mm -hmm. is it even this week? The IPCC reports on vulnerability uh, came out. And again, Africa as a continent was out there showing how, especially East Africa and uh, North, East Africa and West Africa being the most vulnerable, especially the Sub-Saharan African countries being highly vulnerable, mainly because of the lack of resources, mainly because of poverty. Because when you look at Kasese, where the floods happen, no, the rich people don't settle there. Because it's, it's clearly known it's a flood-prone area. Why? Because the temperatures are rising, and it's close to a mountain, a glaciated mountain. And once the temperatures are rising globally, the glaciers are receding, the glaciers are melting, and they flood out of the, like, the rivers. So this is a flood prone zone. It's only the poor people that can't afford fancy land in a, a, you know, a secure, flood secure area that settle there. So that is why the climate crisis is not just climate crisis. It's, it's a social crisis, a public health crisis, a food security crisis, a water crisis. And it increases the injustices that are already happening in the world. The gap between the developed and developing world is increasing. And uh, I think, as, I, as, as I'd already mentioned, is that as young Africans, we have two, I mean, a number of ways that we can work to help our communities to adapt is calling the polluters to pay, calling our leaders to act, because if they don't act, if, if no one acts on climate change, again, it's our communities to suffer, but also innovating or helping those ones who can innovate to innovate and act on climate change. And I just have one more for you, and then we'll turn it over to the audience for questions. But yeah. you just mentioned a few ways that people can get involved. How can folks in the African diaspora support youth who are on the continent to make progress? Oh, that's a really interesting question because I believe like people in the diaspora, the Africans in the, in the diaspora have actually seen the difference in, you know, enthusiasm on climate action compared to in their African countries. Like here in the UK, it's not that everyone knows that climate change is happening, but most people know at least. But back in our countries, it's just like, yeah, we've seen it. We've seen the seasons, non, they're not predictable, the droughts are increasing, but they don't know that climate change is happening. The media here, you see BBC, The Guardian, and everything, they're always talking about climate change, but you won't find it in our countries. Like uh, during, I think before COP, uh, when we had elections last year, very bad elections, I don't want to talk about them in Uganda, and uh, I remember calling on the, uh, the presidential parents to to ask them what is it that they're talking about climate change. The whole world is talking about climate change, but our leaders had not thought about anything regarding climate change in their manifesto. I only succeeded with two of them <laughs> who uh, addressed the issue, but the rest uh, didn't. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, would it be calling on those leaders, calling on presidential hopefuls? Would it be yeah, helping to raise yeah, that's, more? Yeah, that's what I was thinking, that the diaspora have the power to, to first of all, most people who are, most Africans in diaspora love, love home very much and they want to invest home. So the kind of investments they do, the kind of investments they support back home matter. Two is that there are a lot of young people with uh, crowd, crowds crowdfunding on for their projects and initiatives on climate action they can support in that way and uh, some countries have like diaspora representatives in their governments so the diaspora can drive the climate agenda in governments 
because if they have access, they're always doing one way or the other. They always have access to uh, the governments. Um, the other way is uh, helping young innovators uh, in terms of you know knowledge, it may not be finance. Sometimes finance is like the list out there of the people that of what young people actually need in Africa. Sometimes it's just the space to talk about the project. Sometimes it's just you know advice because of your experience on investments in the UK, let's say on wind power or renewable energy, just having, because they, they, these initiatives are online for young people, these innovations, sustainability innovations are online, just providing your inputs as someone who has had the experience of being in Africa, knowing the investment opportunity there and the way initiatives are, but also being in, a, in another, another country that, where things are different and seeing where context, of course context matters, so seeing what works, what could work in Africa and something like that. And uh, of course, when you look at uh, the activists, sometimes it's just about you know amplifying their voices. If so, if there's an African activist or an activist from another, let's say an island, a, a small state, a small island state, developing country, which are really vulnerable, highly vulnerable to climate change, it's just amplifying their voices, even just tweeting, retweeting what they they are the, the message that they have shared can be of great impact that you cannot even measure. I think we are definitely over time at this point, but <laughs> thank you for the wonderful conversation. Um, and thank you so much, Rose, for joining us. Let's give her a big round of applause. Thank you. Yeah.